Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Track 2, Session 2. This session is entitled Pan-European Projects, a Collaborative Approach to Research. We have three speakers on the session today, the first of which is Dr Claire Skentlebury. The Network Manager at the Council of the European Bioregions and Secretary General of the European Biotechnology Network. Having obtained a PhD in biochemistry, Dr Skentlebury decided to focus her efforts on the communication and networking of science and moved into a scientific and marketing communication role. She acted as the national contact point for FP5 before becoming an independent consultant in biotechnology development. <laughs> Along with a group of clusters across Europe, uh, ten years ago Dr Skentlebury was actually uh, involved in the creation of the Council of European Bioregions. Dr Skentlebury, would you like to join me on stage? Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. I hope you can all hear me okay. I'll shout anyway, just to be on the safe side. I kind of come here today wearing two hats. I was introduced as uh, Council of European Bioregions, which is a fantastic network of clusters, but I also run the European Biotechnology Network, which is a network directly of uh, industry and academic scientists from across Europe in all sectors. So my job is great because I get to talk about science directly, but I also get to look at the factors that drive the development and delivery of science, knowing where the politics and the money overlaps with the technical stuff that you do in the labs. And so really what I'm going to talk about today is the incredible importance of clustering science and business and then networking those clusters across Europe. And this comes down to, of course, the science and the skills, but it also, of course, comes down to the money, which is what we all think about these days, where the money is coming from and how we can afford to deliver science to its destination. So I have to work out to work this. Yes. So I'm going to start with a quick introduction to the Council of European Bioregions. Of course, I would say this, but it is an extremely active network of biotechnology clusters across Europe mostly working within the healthcare sector because that's really where clusters have developed most strongly on the life sciences side. And we're networked through people who are the primary point of contact for small companies within their clusters and their bio communities. So it can be their official cluster manager, it can be a science park that is also an incubator, it can be the local tech transfer office of a university. We don't define ourselves by the type of organisations that, that may join the network. We define ourselves by the role that they have in building their bio-community and their cluster. And in fact, even use of the word cluster is misleading, because if you were genuinely to say, what is a cluster in Europe, our number of members would probably be fewer than six. There are very few significant clusters in Europe. Most regions have developing bio-communities that are trying to build economic return from the science that they carry out within them. They haven't yet reached the clusters stage. And we'll look at that as we go through. So we work with 50 partners, but we also have global partnerships because, of course, the world is extremely small, particularly in life sciences. So we work very closely with clusters in the US, Japan, further into Asia, Australia, so that science, you can always reach out to find the right science and the right business for you. So what's our mission? And this is really comes back to why we were founded. We want to build a competitive European life sciences sector through defragmentation and removing the beautiful man-made barriers that Europe likes to create for itself that keep science in one place, in one organisation type, uh, owning, owned by one person. Life is far too short to try and develop your science and your technology through to fruition on your own. You have to do it together. And so one of the things that we do is try to eliminate all the artificial barriers. We'll never be able to do it officially, so we sort of work in a subversive, guerrilla-like fashion, which is actually much more fun and much cheaper. It's also much faster. So we try to defragment the way that cluster managers can understand how to start and grow and deliver a cluster, how they can reach out and find the technologies and the skills that they need, regardless of where they come from, transforming Europe's amazing ability to compete against itself into an ability to work together in a much more harmonious fashion. We'll leave the arguing to the politicians at regional and national and European level and just get on with the job of delivering the science underneath that. And we want to provide a, a Europe-wide neutral platform for the delivery of cluster technologies and cluster outcomes because we are one cluster. Europe is a cluster. It is not a collection of 27 countries, each doing their own thing with hundreds of regions. 
doing their own thing underneath that. People look at Europe from outside as one cluster. They do not want to have to go to 200 regions to find out what each individual cluster might or might not be doing. So why are clusters essential? This is a really great technical conference that's looking at all the factors that drive science forward. And clusters are particularly important within healthcare life sciences because of the nature of the business that we're in. It's extremely high-risk science, as you all know in this room. The science is high-risk, the business is high-risk. More things fail than succeed on its journey through the pipeline to the patient or the market. And that is really reflected in the nature of the organisations that get involved in delivering the science to market. Small to medium enterprises can often have a perilously short shelf life. And everybody that works with small companies knows the general reign of terror that exists from the day that you're born until the day you're either bought out by some pharmaceutical company or quietly close the doors and uh, switch the lights off. So they can have a very short life and money is never certain for very long periods of time. So it's always about where the next money will come from. And this is not helped, of course, by the fact that the investment, because the science is risky, the investment is small the earlier you are. So it comes in small doses, and investors are extremely cautious about where they put it. But this, of course, doesn't help a company deliver a science at all. And even with, the smallest com even with a well-funded company, the needs, the skills needs, and the knowledge needs are far beyond the capability of that company. I know this because I sort of cut my teeth within the Cambridge cluster in the UK. And when the SME sector and the cluster was really booming and investment was pouring in, companies went a bit crazy. They bought themselves beautiful buildings. They grew, to, they grew from a team of three to a team of 250. Now they're a team of three again. But even then, they couldn't do what they needed to do inside the company. They know the science but you cannot be an expert in every step of the business development and delivery. You need to go outside to get that. It's a complete waste of money to spend, it's a complete waste of money to buy yourself a patent attorney in-house because they're going to cost you loads of money and you just need to go externally to a good patent attorney. So the skills required to deliver science as a business and as a product are beyond almost all small companies. And that is why you need to operate within a cluster. So, using that point exactly, you have to say, clusters create a critical mass of expertise. You don't need to go very far to find your next business manager, your patent attorney, uh, the local, you know, a venture capitalist. You need to go outside your company, and a cluster can do that. You cannot do it if your company is on its own in the middle of nowhere. You will not have the business staff, you will not have the science staff that you need. And so a cluster creates an amazing environment for people startups, mid-term, and mature small companies. So at startup stage, when you're looking at reviewing scientific applications, say, does this make a good company? Particularly if you don't have any prior business need, a cluster and all the people that live within it are going to tell you if that science has legs as a business. They're going to tell you if somebody else did that five miles down the road two years ago and it was a disaster. They're going to tell you if somebody was doing it in the US, Australia, Japan because the world of biotech is very, very small, and there's no point spending your money and your effort on a technology that is already being developed somewhere else. You will not last very long, and you certainly won't get very much money. And you need access to expert managers. In our work within the Council of European Bioregions, we look at all aspects of factors that affect cluster development, and the science is the least thing that impacts on cluster development. It is the access to skilled business people and experienced business people that is the rate-limiting step. It always comes back to the ability to deliver a science as a business. So once you've got your seed funding, you have your fabulously novel idea, you're going to grow. You need to understand how you're going to spend that money effectively. A lot of companies in Cambridge learned that it's not a good idea to buy yourself a big shiny building with your first round of uh, funding because the big shiny building isn't actually going to do your work for you. And we still have companies in Cambridge that are now almost subletting a section of their own big building and desperately trying to rent out the rest of it to fund their work. You also need to carry on fundraising. The day you start looking for your next round of investment is the day you receive the previous one. A good business manager inside a small company is always on the road. They're never in the office. And you can expect an answer from their um, iPhone any time of day or night, and they will never be on a landline. 
you also need to understand how to expand your business. And this is all about understanding people and understanding the skills that you need. Particularly if your small company has come from very strong academic backgrounds, you need to understand the evolution in business skills needed. You will need to understand that you need regulatory experience, clinical experience. The experience of the original technology is not enough to deliver the, that particular technology to market. And when you get, if you're still alive, to the delivery end of your small company, which is brilliant, you are probably not going to be the next GlaxoSmithKline, but what you are going to have is something that GlaxoSmithKline might want to buy or you might get acquired. So you need to understand how you're going to, A, find the next step for your business in terms of merger, acquisition, licensing, and you need to be able to deliver your package of technology to the next stage in the value chain because even with all the money in the world, small companies do not usually take their own products to market within life sciences. Some of them do, if you're in diagnostics, if you're in kits, if you're in med tech. But if you're in the rather tricky business of drug discovery and development, it's going to be somebody else that goes to market with your product. So the cluster effect, and this is why it is so important, is that they de-risk high-risk science. And the key thing that we found over the years is a definition of what makes a cluster. When has something reached a cluster is when a scientist will relocate their family to your region to take a high-risk job, because if they get fired after six months, they know they're likely to get another job. So it all comes down to people. Michael Porter said a long time ago, he said, Pe clusters will never grow in horrible places. And he was right, because why would you put your move your children to somewhere where the schools are rubbish? You have to think of the people when you're looking at the clustering effect. And it also helps to absorb shocks very well. When you've, we've had a series of pharma company closures recently, sites closing across Europe. And when in Sweden, for example, a large company site from AstraZeneca closes down that was literally the only business in that region that was life sciences oriented, the impact was absolute. All of the skills are potentially lost. Whereas if that closes down within a region with a cluster present, those skills can be absorbed into the rest of the cluster and hopefully the technologies that are leaving the site, the people that are leaving the site, continue to contribute to delivering commercial packages from biotechnology. So I cannot tell you enough how important clusters are, of course. <laughs> so why is cluster networking so important? I've told you how super critical clusters are, so why do they have to be networked? You know, surely we can all just do it, off, grow our cluster and we'll be fine. But again, the, econ the current economic climate makes it an absolute necessity to network clusters together. When clusters originally started booming within Europe, sort of 20, 25 years ago, I was based, as I said, in the Cambridge cluster, and the key elements that allowed that cluster to boom as it has were a combination of a lot of private investment, investment suddenly coming into life sciences. It was pharmaceutical companies undergoing their first substantial contraction and releasing skilled managers into the wild to roam freely, foraging from hedges. And it was public money also available to build infrastructure and to build long-term strategies. Now, we pretty much have none of those things now. The only thing we have from that list of success points is pharma contractions continuing. So what you have is that a region cannot say, right, I'm going to build myself the world's finest cluster in 10 years because they haven't got enough money to do that. And if private investors are not going to come in in enough strength to build enough critical mass in small companies to stop jiving, fueling that cluster. And the pharma contractions, and this is one of the biggest things, is you're releasing farm, skilled scientists and business managers into the wild to forage in the hedges, but they're not finding the money to start up new companies and they're not finding employment opportunities in other companies because there isn't any money to employ them, which means you're losing the skills that you have developed inside those pharmaceutical companies and they will probably leave the region. So it is super critical to get your clusters networked so you minimise those three points and you maximise your understanding of how you can develop your cluster quickly and cheaply because Europe has run out of money and time in which to do its development. It now needs to start delivering from now. So if a region has a serious intention to build a cluster, and I, when I say serious, I do not mean the many regions that I speak to that go... Yeah, in 10 years, we'll ha we don't have anything now, but in 10 years, we'll have a cluster like Oxford. 
you have to take them aside and point out a few home truths that A, they will never be a cluster like Oxford because it grew at a different time and a completely different space. And also, if they haven't got any money and strategy, a beautiful brochure and some fine words are not going to build you a cluster, regardless of how good your basic research is. So regional development agencies, if they're growing clusters, they have to set themselves realistic long-term targets for what they can achieve with the tools and the talents within their regions. You know, if you say we're going to be a leading oncology cluster, you had better damn well have a really good oncology science base. You can't start if you haven't got the science. You need to understand the actions that it takes to build a cluster and the kind of skills that you will need from people to build that cluster. And you really need to plan long-term and invest long-term. Some of the best regions we see in Europe, obviously countries like Germany, have invested at a very high level for a very long time. And they started from a very low level in 1990, where Germany essentially had no life science clusters and no commercial life sciences you know, in small companies. And they've built that from nothing, but they have spent a lot of money on it, as we all know. And other regions in countries that would surprise you more, for example, Catalonia in Spain has invested very consistently over the last 10 or 12 years, and they're really seeing the benefits of that. Spain is a very active country internationally within commercial biotechnology, and it might surprise you, but they've done a really good job, and they have continued to invest despite their interesting economic times. So to get it right, you've got to get it right the first time now because you haven't got 25 years to grow your cluster with lots of learning points and lots of mistakes. And you can only do that by learning from others. And this is where the networking comes in. A regional development agency cannot afford an expensive mistake by pouring its money down one hole and it not seeing anything come from it. So cluster managers and regional development agencies must learn things and they must learn them from other people and they must learn them now. And it's also an evolving sector. As the nature and the econ economics behind biotechnology and the commercialization of biotechnology change, you have to evolve your cluster planning. We still see models coming out of regions in Europe where they go, yeah, we're going to build a cluster where all the small companies grow to be mid-sized companies and then large companies, and then they'll move into clinical trials. That model broke about five minutes after it was invented because they soon realised, as we said, SMEs don't have the skills or the capability to deliver themselves as large companies. They are small, transient things that deliver packages of technology to the next stage of development. So why am I talking about this? This is precisely why we were founded. When I was working in the Cambridge cluster about a million years ago, we had... We worked with cluster managers all over Europe, and we realised that we would like to work together more formally because there was so much to learn and to share from each other. And pretty much all we had in terms of formal learning or the formal partnerships then was through our regional development agencies and regional politicians, which, as you know, can often be more of a hindrance than a help. So we decided that it would be much more practical if we worked together directly. And so we founded the Council of European Bioregions to be an incredibly practical cluster-facing network that would bring cluster managers together from all over the world to learn from the good things and also, very critically, to learn about the bad things. Because knowing not to do something because it's failed spectacularly in other places is very useful and it saves you a lot of money. And we needed to be able to do things quickly and we needed to be able to do things cheaply. The money was draining out of cluster development 10, 12 years ago, as the first economic bubbles started bursting around life sciences. So we didn't have time to have our 10-year investment plan. We needed to know in six months if something would work or not. And we kept away from the politics, very much so, because as you also all know, that also slows things down quite considerably. And biotechnology continues whether there are politicians involved or not. So in fact, we have... We only have like real people in the network, which is very nice. So they don't have any hidden agendas. They're very practical. They're very proactive. And they share a lot of stuff that you wouldn't see in a larger format. So how does the networking serve them? Every single cluster has a slightly different need. If, if you wanted to just learn from large clusters, you would just go to Cambridge, Oxford, Medicon Valley, Munich. But they can't tell you very much. Those clusters, are particularly, particularly ones in the UK, are very spontaneous. They don't have a strategy. They blow with the wind. They couldn't find a strategy if you gave them a torch and told them where it was. 
so they can learn from smaller regions growing who have had to plan a strategy from zero to know how they take technology from universities, how they break down barriers between industry and academia, how they attract investment to a region. And that's a huge learning point for those clusters that have grown in Europe that don't have any of that learning. And of course, smaller emerging bio communities need to know how a cluster works. They need to know how humans like to interact. What are the most effective ways to get them to do things outside their own lab or their own company? To understand the flow of experiences and how to facilitate that around a cluster. And so they, the small clusters can learn that from the larger spontaneous clusters because that's what they do all the time. And particularly in the larger clusters, because there's very little political drive behind them, these are spontaneous, usually privately funded activities. So if somebody's willing to pay for it, then you know that it's a good activity. So how, does it, how do we make it work? We're a pretty small, lightweight financial uh, network, as some of our members in the room will know. But we try to be inclusive rather than expensive and exclusive. We do things like we run special interest groups around critical topics for cluster development. So we look at developing cluster culture. We look at clinical innovation, which is a very sexy group at the moment, where we're looking at how to bring hospitals more firmly into the innovation process inside a cluster, how to find how small companies can get into hospitals with their technologies quickly, rather than having to go through a sort of large Philips or Siemens-style health technology assessment process, because as we know, small companies can't do that. So that's the sort of groups that we run. Anything that will help a cluster manager develop their cluster more effectively is what we do. We share good practice. We develop up joint activities. Because if you're going to do a service for SMEs in one cluster, you might as well do it in lots of clusters. So we beg, borrow, and steal ideas off each other all the time, and it's really great. We also want it to be a project platform. There are, you know European projects, there's loads of them, and often they don't know each other exist. You can have similar topics going on in four or five places, and they all exist in their tiny little bubbles. Same for cluster management. You get regionally driven projects that would be really useful if, they, if you could find out about them. So every, our members bring their small local projects and bring them up to a European level. So not only do they get advice from everybody in Europe, whether they want it or not, but they also get to deliver the results to everybody in Europe. And we also come up with our own cunning plans for projects and have put together several large, several large EC-funded initiatives, such as a project called ABC Europe, which brought together 12 clusters around Europe to develop new services for, to help cluster development. So you can do much more together as a network of clusters than you can apart. And we want to be a voice for small companies in Europe. There aren't really any effective platforms that speak for small companies directly. And nobody knows their small companies better than cluster managers. They are there through the good times and the bad, and they are right on their doorstep. And Europe, we need to make it smaller. It's kind of small already, but you need to be able to know where you can access a technology. So I can find exactly the technology or the person I want by sending an email to my network. And somebody goes, yeah, we got some of that. And then five minutes, I have my answer. It could be from anywhere, but I can find it. And we also have to go beyond Europe. Like I said before, people look at Europe as one place. They don't look at it as 27 countries, all of which they have to go to individually to find things. If somebody from Massachusetts wants to find a technology that does stuff, we can do that for them as quickly as I can do it with my NEM members. It is exactly the way to find the technologies. So what are the factors for the success, both of cluster development and of networking clusters so they can develop better? Depoliticising it is a massive step forward. Because as you all know, Europe's interestingly different at the moment. And every four years, faces change on the political scene. And old ideas get thrown out, new ideas get brought in. And as we know, life sciences operates on a much longer time scale than four years. So if you come up with a great cluster plan at year one, you really don't need it ripped up at year four and replaced with something else. So a lot of our members work at depoliticizing how clusters are supported and planned so that when faces change, the plans and the money stay the same. The money, it's easier to get the plans to stay than the money, but we're working on that. And everybody has something to learn. We're a very neutral platform, so everybody has a voice as important as their neighbours. And it's amazing what you can learn when everybody comes to the table as equals, regardless of the size of your cluster. 
And really, it's the understanding that the world is too small to operate in isolation. The largest clusters in Europe are members of CEBA, as are the smallest biocommunities, because even the largest cluster cannot do it on its own. And the skills, that is probably the biggest thing within cluster development and cluster networking, is to get the skills right. The people we know in biotechnology that support it are passionate about what they do. Faces don't really change in our network. The people have been there for 15 years in their clusters. It's their mission in life. So to share their skills, to take them from cluster A to cluster B, to help them understand what they have to do is absolutely critical. It is not a job for civil servants. And, uh, and as most of them work on tiny, tiny salaries that might run out at any minute, it's definitely not a job for civil servants. So that's pretty much it on my lecture of A, why clusters are so very important, and B, why it is also critical to network those clusters together so that Europe has one biotechnology cluster rather than 327 if you listen to the latest figures. So I'd say thank you very much. I don't think I've... No, I haven't had another slide. That's good. I'd say thanks very much. You're always welcome to come and be part of the network, whether you're a cluster manager or not. You know, I might send you a newsletter or two if you're very lucky. But it's a pleasure talking to you, and I hope it was useful. Thank you very much. Thank you.